This is the I Love Success Podcast. I'm Peter Jabrukovsky, and I have made a vow to myself to help as many people as possible to achieve their dreams. Let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome to the I Love Success Podcast. In self-development, we talk about finding your mountain and go after your dreams, your goals. But what if your mountain is actually the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest? I sit down with Kurt Wedberg, a really cool adventurer and mountaineer who has climbed Mount Everest not only once, not only twice, but three times by two different routes. He's also one of approximately 400 people around the world who have climbed the seven highest mountains in all continents in the world. This is an amazing guy. We will share from the heart. So kick back, relax, and enjoy. Let's welcome Kurt Wedberg. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, I'm super excited to have you here. And this is... I was so excited because we booked a time, but we, I didn't communicate that I wanted to meet you, but we got to, to make this happen right before your flight. So that's super exciting. And it seems like you're quite the adventurer. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've lived uh, a fun life adventuring around the world and figuring out a way to make a living doing it. it uh, I... Uh, being a mountaineering guide combines two things I love to do, which is not only mountaineering, but also working with people yeah. and, uh, and helping them achieve their goals and their dreams. And, uh, and that's what really drives me is the idea of helping somebody achieve that goal and then actually seeing it happen for them. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I help people achieve their goals as well. And there's some amazing feeling when you get to be a part of their journey, right? There is, there is. And it's, I, I think it speaks to a, an attitude too of it's, it's not like in your job too. It's not about you. Yeah. It's, it's about seeing the success of somebody else and sharing in their success. And, and, and that to me is, is very fulfilling, very rewarding. Yeah. Uh, Kurt, I'm, I'm curious, like, can you just talk about like your childhood being a kid and at what point are you like, I'm going to climb the highest mountains of the world? Yeah, well, I, I got raised by uh, two loving parents who were very adventurous and, uh, and did a lot of exploring in the outdoors. And so I got brought up around it. You know, I have pictures of my father going on hikes and me and a baby carrier and uh, my mom was actually hiking uh, right up until two weeks before I was born and so I got brought up around this and uh, I you know going to school I was reading books about mountaineering and um, one particular book was a book called Four Against Everest which was a written about four guys who tried to, at the time, it was an illegal ascent going in through China uh, back in the 60s and trying to climb it. And they didn't make it, but the book had a big impression on me. And that kind of always sat in the back of my mind. And then as I you know, grew up and went to the mountains more and more, uh, and then eventually decided to pursue a career as a mountaineering guide, I, I kind of had that in the back of my head. And so when the opportunity came, I, I jumped at it. And my first time was 1995, and then went back two more times after that. Wow. And I think what, what, you, what you have done is pretty cool because you, you not only climbed Mount Everest three times, you've done all the seven summits and you've been on more than 130 different expeditions, right? Yeah. So you're a pro. It's not a one-time gig. That's correct. Yeah. <laughs> but like, how do you actually, like that dream started, how does the process actually go from like, I want to do this to actually doing it? That's a, that's a great question. You know, I, I think a lot of people, you know, they have goals, they have dreams, they have things they would love to do. And, and there's something I think about taking those first baby steps and then just continuing with it. And sometimes I think it's a personal drive. And sometimes I think it's the environment you put yourself in that 
allows you to be set up for success that takes away some of those roadblocks from you. And, you know, so for example, in mountaineering, you know, it's uh, looking at climbing a big high mountain, whether that be Mount Everest or just some other big peak, for example, Mount Whitney in California here is the highest mountain in the lower 48 states and a big goal for a lot of people. If you look at that, having never done anything, it'd be sort of like putting a big porterhouse steak on your plate and trying to pick it up and eat it in one bite, which you can't really do. So you, you start with these small baby steps. You, know, you, you go on a hike somewhere. Maybe you know, we're in Santa Monica right now, uh, maybe taking a hike in the Santa Monica Mountains, and then maybe going into the Angeles Forest or climbing Mount San Jacinto out of Palm Springs or something like that. And then kind of, you know, that, that kind of uh, gets the, the excitement going and then just making the time to keep doing that and keep building up the steps. And so whether it's mountaineering or some other goal you might have in life, uh, you know, taking those initial steps and, and then, you know, maybe it's having friends around you that you go with on trips and they help keep you motivated and, and such, you know. So there's, there's other ways that I think will motivate people, but it has to start from inside yeah. and, then, and then just taking the initiative to take that first baby step on your own. Yeah, I think like... In your case, it was that book. In my case, I'm a world medalist in karate. It was like watching the Karate Kid and uh -huh. made me want to do something more. But after that, the environment and all those mentors around you is so important, taking those baby steps. Do you want to talk about, is there any person in your life who kind of pushed you and helped you to, to go after this? Yeah, there, there were a few people at the very top of the list would be my father. Uh, my father had been a mountaineer since the 50s, and, uh, and so he brought me up around it. And not only did he take me out in the mountains a lot and, and shared that love, which was a very infectious love of the mountains and uh, something I got to experience quite a bit, uh, but he was very supportive in, in what I wanted to do. And, you know, he has a, a great story himself about how he ended up in the career he ended up in, um, which was actually being a stockbroker, but uh, he always told me, Wh whatever you do in this world, do something you really enjoy, and that's really what's going to make you happy, and uh, you know, there's sort of an old saying, you know, do whatever you want to do, and you'll never work another day in your life kind of a thing, because yeah. you're going to enjoy doing it, and it sounds like a great cliche, but it was one I took very literally, and so I just I pursued it in in that fashion, and so you know it's on the one hand you know, you look at a mountain guide oh yeah you know, you get uh, you get make a living going all over the world and kind of thing. There's a lot of hard work involved in it, yeah. but uh, but that um, that kind of drive uh, from my my father just saying you know. Pursue what you really enjoy doing, and uh, and that was kind of the biggest influencer for me. Yeah, and I think it's important to, like, we all have those people that kind of help us on the way. And I know, uh, I said that on other podcasts, but Maya Angelou said something when she was on stage speaking. She said, "I come as one, but I stand as ten thousand, mm -hmm. and which you mean all the people that help you in some little way to come." to this summit or this peak in my life. And uh, just curious, like, so when did you decide that you're gonna climb Mount, Mount Everest? Like how many years prior to 95 and what's the kind of the process? So, like I said, you know, it was always sitting in the back of my head. And so when I started pursuing mountaineering more seriously and as a career, uh, as a mountaineering guide, I started climbing bigger and bigger mountains and there's a mentorship involved and so I was you know an apprentice guide helping more experienced guides on trips and yeah. so I started going to places like um, uh, Denali in Alaska as an assistant guide and uh, and uh, Mount Rainier I was an uh, assistant guide up there for a while before I became a senior guide there and uh, so there's this mentorship that took place. And while I'm doing that, you know, I'm going to places like Denali. I'm going to climb volcanoes in Mexico, um, Kil Kilimanjaro, uh, you know, uh, mountains in South America, such as Aconcagua or volcanoes in Ecuador. And, 
And so each one of those steps is, is a step along the way bringing me closer to Mount Everest. And when I climbed Aconcagua for the first time, uh, the elevation of that is 22,841 feet. And it's the highest mountain in the world outside of the Himalaya. Yeah. And so if you're going to go any higher than that, you're going to have to go to the Himalaya. And so I'd been to an expedition uh, to a mountain called Shisha Pangma, uh, it's 14th highest mountain in the world, and so I'd experienced the Himalayas. And so all this was kind of leading up, and I and I felt good all along the way to that point, and I felt like I could give Everest a good, honest attempt, yeah. and so that was kind of the build up to it. How many years was that build up? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, I'd say my whole life, yeah. but in as far as seriously taking some of those bigger steps. Um, I climbed Denali in July of, of um, 92, yeah. and that was kind of the highest thing I'd been to at that time, and then Mount Everest was spring of 95. Yeah. So give that, whatever that math works out to be, you yeah, know, three, three, four, three, four years, yeah. about a lifetime of training and Correct. getting ready. Yeah. So when you are at the peak of Denali, are you thinking, excuse my life, or I'm going to fucking go for Mount Everest now? Mm -hmm. Like, what are you thinking in that moment? Like, this is amazing, but I need to get to the highest peak. Like, <laughs> what are you thinking in that moment? That's, that's a great question. And it was, it was never like that. I never looked at Denali as, I'm just doing this as a step to get to Mount Everest. Yeah. I, uh, I, and I feel very fortunate in this, and this was something else I learned from my father, is just to enjoy the moment where you're at at the time. Mm. Uh, because you, know, you just don't know what's going to happen the next day yeah. in, in your life. And so to enjoy where you are at that time, at that moment. And so when I was sitting on the top of Denali for that first time, you know, it was about minus 40 degrees. Yeah. And somebody will ask, well, is that centigrade or Fahrenheit? Well, actually, they're the same at minus 40, as it turns <laughs> out. So oh, uh, wow. <laughs> very, very cold. And, yeah. uh, you know, it's 20,320 feet yeah. in elevation. And so you're high up in the air in a very cold environment. I'm At the time, I'm looking at that going, you know, wow, this is really cool that I've managed to get here. Yeah. And then when you're on the top of a mountain, uh, one of the things any mountaineer will tell you is that the summit is not the end of your climb. It's exactly halfway. Yeah. You know, it'd be similar to going down to the beach here and, and swimming three miles out from the shore, out into the water and going, okay, well, I'm done. Well, no, you're not done. You gotta yeah. swim three miles back. And so when you're on the summit of a mountain, after you've, you've experienced that joy and that elation, you have to, realize that you have to get back down safely yeah. and 80% of mountaineering accidents happen on the descent yeah. and so you know you're definitely not done when you're there and so it's after you get down off that and you finish that climb and you're you know you're you're processing those memories and those experiences that's when you start thinking okay you know what, what, what could I do next yeah. so do you think like uh, do you think a lot of not only climbers, but let's talk about climbers lack that mental training that like when you're up there, you still have to stay focused because this is now the hard part begin because you're so tired, you're happy, you got that adrenaline rush, but you got to get down safely. Like, do you, what's your opinion about that? And how do you work with your mind to be able to do that safely? Yeah, well, that, it's a great question. And, you know, like I was saying, 80% of mountaineering accidents happen on the descent. Yeah. And it's easy to see why from a mental perspective because people are just focused on, they're, all their energy is focused on getting to the top of this mountain. Yeah. But, and that's, that can be a goal, but your first goal needs to be to get back safely. Yeah. And you, you're just tagging the summit along the way. And you, you have to keep that mental perspective uh, straight because that's what happens to a lot of people is they don't. They just they get to the summit and they expend all the energy they think they've had to get to the top of the mountain. And then they're there, but they don't have the energy to get back down. Or they start losing their, their, their focus because they're already starting to think about you know, uh, uh, what's the first meal they're going to have when they get back or, you know, what do they have to do when they get back home and they, they're not in the moment 
anymore. And they, you need to stay in that moment and stay focused. And it's a, it's a mental process, but one that's very important because, you know, in mountaineering, you know, the slightest little letdown in your mental awareness can literally mean the difference of life or death. Yeah. Uh, so I want to talk about 95 when you actually uh, climb Mount Everest. What I've uh, learned a little bit at that time, I think it was maybe the year after that there was a lot of people started to come to climb Mount Everest who weren't that experienced. It became almost like a business. Was that, was that prior to your uh, climb or after? Well, it was already starting yeah. in the early 90s yeah. and it picked up a lot of steam after the 96 uh, disaster happened. Yeah. And so our expedition in 95 was previous to that. Yeah. Uh, and it was interesting watching what happened because the weather our year was pretty good. Uh, you know, I, um, out of my three summits up there, that first time was, uh, was the most comfortable I'd been up there. It was about 18 degrees and no wind. Yeah. And my summit photo, actually, my down suit is unzipped down yeah, to my waist. Yeah. And I'm wearing spring ski gloves and no wool cap. You know, it's just amazing to be at 29,000 feet and be, yeah. and, and actually be that comfortable. But, uh, the following year, the weather was a little more unpredictable, and there were a lot of people going up. And but more importantly, there's a lot of people. Again, they they weren't they weren't thinking about just summiting that mountain and getting down safely. They were thinking about what happens afterwards, yeah. and you know, sort of the notoriety, if they will, you know, of having climbed. This is pre Instagram, but this was like. It's a cool way. It's a cool thing to say. That yeah. Climb Mount Everest, right? Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, um, I'm actually convinced of this too. And um, I, I have not said this a lot in a in a sort of a broadcast environment, but I, I'm convinced that a lot of the people that go to Mount Everest, their goal is not to climb Mount Everest. The end goal is to be standing in front of 200 people telling everybody about it. And I and I and Eagle I think based. that misses the point of of if, you know you it's a lot of work to get there and it's a dangerous place to be and you know when it's all said and done you know then you can think about you know sharing that adventure with others but I think people miss that and then at the same time getting back to your um, your uh, point about it being a business you know there's people that are running expeditions there and they're they're making a business out of out of taking people to Mount Everest. Yeah which is fine, uh, but it's an expensive place to be, yeah. and there aren't a lot of people who are ready to be there. Yeah. And so they'll, a lot of those people are just taking anybody who will write a check to be there, and they may not necessarily be ready to be on Mount Everest. Yeah, I, I think that it's a crazy thing what ego does with us human beings and the, f the feeling of being significant. And I'm, I'm studying success, so I see this not only in mountain climbers, but we see this in everything. People will put themselves in really dangerous situation without being prepared just to be able to talk about it. Sure. Which we, I think we're going to get more deeper to your why and why you're doing this, but it's so important that it comes from the heart and that you really want to do this because the idea, like I had an idea that I wanted to climb Mount Everest, but when I started reading about it, I said, no, I don't want to climb Mount Everest. I want a picture on the top of Mount Everest, uh -huh. which is not the <laughs> right reason, right? Right. So this is, that journey is not for me. And I, I realize that now maybe it's going to change if I hang out with you for a couple of years or something. But <laughs> let's go on a few trips together. Yeah, let's start with a hike in Santa Monica Mountains first. You bet. Uh, uh, so just curious, when you're, when you're up there like climbing, you have so much time to think, to be with yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, what is going on in your mind during those climbs? That's a great question because there's a lot that goes on in somebody's mind and I would say that it kind of it it uh, gets down to why people are there in the first place and you know for me and I think I'm expressing a similar sentiment to a lot of my friends in the mountaineering world is 
you climb mountains for a few different reasons, and some of them are very tangible that you can point to. For example, the, the um, testing yourself physically yeah. uh, and just the idea that you're doing a healthy activity. It's a great way to be healthy. Another yeah. one is just to enjoy the environment you're in, and, you know, which is a lot different than an asphalt jungle of a big city, yeah. and just you know, to, to take in that experience of being outside. There are other reasons that I think people do it that uh, are much more deeper, much more spiritual, uh, and, and there, there's a mental aspect to that. And some of them are so deep that people have a hard time even expressing it. It's just a, a, a deep spiritual feeling they have of, of being outside and, you know, and doing that. And so there's... Uh, you know, they're, they're, when you're climbing a mountain, a lot of that is going through your mind. And so, for example, for me as a mountain guide, you know, my, it isn't just about my own experience. It's about the experience of the climbers I'm with, yeah. right? And so there's definitely you know, a safety aspect and something, you know, I'm looking at big picture and how people are doing and what I can do to help them, you know, maybe modify their te technique a little bit to help them be more efficient and yeah. things like that. But all of them are also experiencing some of these physical challenges and mental challenges. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, sometimes I'll explain it like this. is like, you know, you go on a hike, and this could be anything, whether it's a big mountain climb or just a, a hike that you're gone for a few hours on. It's a chance for you to step out of your normal daily routine of life mm -hmm. and be able to look at it from the outside in. And there's something very powerful about doing that and it gives you a new perspective, a fresh perspective on things. And so when you, you finish that hike or finish that big climb and you go back into your daily life, you come into it with a new fresh perspective on things that I think would be very therapeutic and, uh, and very healthy to do. Yeah, uh, it's interesting because what I see in a lot of people, and I know myself, when you like, when you aim for like big goals and big dreams, it's amazing when you do it. But mm -hmm. sometimes life kind of sucks when you get back to like your normal life because <laughs> you were just at the highest mountain in the world, and now you're in everyday life. You're in the line for groceries or waiting for your coffee or like how how does your mind work in those situations? Have you felt that? like emptiness slash depression after a, a big summit? That's a great question. I would say it's not an emptiness or depression, yeah. although I think that is something that you have to watch for yeah. because you've spent all this time and effort you know, doing, for example, climbing your Mount Everest, whether that be physically, you know, literally Mount Everest or whatever it is that big goal of yours is, yeah. and now that's done. And so now what do you do? What, what is next? And, uh, and I think, again, it's, you know, it kind of gets back to this you know, big picture attitude of life. Uh, you know, is, and you know, doing, for example, climbing Mount Everest, well, that's, it's now a part of my life. It's a part of who I am. It's a big experience I've had. But it doesn't define me 100%. And there's many other aspects of my life that are also important. So, so then it's time to move on to, you know, something else, you know, with this new experience, carrying this new experience with you, but having going on to whatever it is might be next, you know, and, and for me today, you know, it's, uh, um, I have a, a lovely wife and a, and a two and a half year old son, and they are just my everything, my world. And, uh, you know, and, of course, I've climbed Mount Everest three times, and that's still a part of me, and I hope to share that with my son someday. And, you know, whether he becomes a mountaineer or not, I don't know, but I'm yeah. going to introduce him to the mountains. Yeah. And he'll certainly know that his dad has done a few things like Mount Everest and some other big climbs, and, yeah. and you know, that's great. And, you know, but what I share with him and what I share with my wife, you know, we, we go on hikes and, and, um, and other adventures, yeah. and they're not... Uh, you know, if we're out skiing or something for the day, I mean, that's not about Mount Everest. Yeah. But 
I have that with me. Yeah. You know, as my wife, you know, who she happens to be a big runner, yeah. and she's done some amazing feats running. You know, but and so that's part of her life as well. But you know, we come together and we have a great day skiing or a great day hiking or yeah. paddleboarding or whatever it is. Yeah. You know, and so I think, I think it's again that focus of. Okay, you're done with that goal. You know, now let's look at the big picture of what your life is. You know, and there's and there's bigger things out there than just that individual goal. You know, there's a, a spiritual aspect to 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 life that is much bigger than just that one thing. I love what you're saying because I'm a martial artist. Mm -hmm. I was an athlete, which means I competed a lot. I had some sure. success, but at the end of the day, I'm a martial artist, and a martial artist is. It's, I think it's pretty similar to maybe a mountaineer. It's a spiritual being who works on himself and try to create a good life in all aspects, not only being the person that does the climbing or the martial art, but you carry yourself in all aspects of life, which is difficult, right? Sure. Uh, I'm curious, when you're at the top, 95, you have about five minutes at the peak, right? Yeah. Or how, how long do you stay there? <laughs> <laughs> it feels like five minutes, yeah. but uh, uh, you know, your, your, your focus when you're on the top yeah. is, for one, you, you treat it as a rest break, yeah. eat and drink something, get some yeah. energy in your fuel your body, yeah. get a couple pictures while you're up there, and then your focus needs to be about getting ready to head on down. Yeah. And, and you think that only takes about five minutes, but then you look at your watch and it's somewhere between 20 and 30 minutes. Oh, wow. okay. <laughs> it, cool. Time goes by pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah, I bet. But how does it feel like the first time you're up there? Like, what can you just kind of like go back to what was going on in your mind at that time? Sure. Oh, that? I remember it quite vividly. Uh, I was, I was climbing up near the summit and uh, the, you know, I'm on supplemental oxygen, and I had started that day on a liter and a half of oxygen, and then it, um, I turned it up to about two liters, a little bit higher up, and I started falling behind my climbing partner that day, and um, I found out later after he had summit and he was on his way back down that he had started at two liters a minute and then cranked it up to two and a half liters, and so I was a half liter behind him, and so he. What, what does that mean? Like, so, well, it means you got more oxygen in, okay. you know, that you're working with, so you're okay. able to move a little bit faster. Okay. Yeah. And so, uh, anyways, he he reaches back into my pack and he cranked it up to two and a half liters a, yeah. a minute. And then, uh, when I got closer to the summit, I uh, I was you know about a hundred yards away or so from it. You can kind of from there you can look up and see the top and. And then uh, I cranked it up to four liters a minute. And what that did is not only made me walk better, but I, I had a little bit more oxygen, enough to experience a little more emotion. Yeah. And, you know, and, and as I'm taking those final steps, I'm just, I, I started reflecting back on everything that I'd gone through to get there, you know, from reading my first books at Mount Everest to going on trips with my with my parents with my family my brother and sister and uh and then all my trips leading up to that and then here i was and i was making those final steps and it was uh overwhelming i had to hold back tears yeah. and i i uh i purposely tried to do my best to hold them back because uh i'd have a trouble breathing yeah. <laughs> and then when i got to the top then it all just poured out and yeah. you know and I I was emotional I was in tears and I was there by myself yeah. and just and I just tried my best just to feel it and take it all in and just yeah. enjoy it because I knew I wouldn't be there that long yeah. and uh, you know and I wanted to enjoy every moment of that and you know there's something very powerful you just look at that and you're standing on that going wow this entire planet and I'm standing higher than anybody else on it right now how cool is that? That is pretty cool. It, it's, it's incredible. Uh, I'm curious because when I did some research, I, I, I learned more about the Sherpas and like mm -hmm. how important are their job for a climber to reach the summit? Well, they're, they're very important. They're a very, very integral part of the process. And basically, uh, 
expeditions will use them in different ways. Yeah. And but you know the Sherpas basically for our audience listening, you know they're a, a race of people. They originally are from Tibet. They migrated to the mountainous regions of Nepal about 400 years ago, where they live to this day. And uh, being local to the area, um, they're they. Some of them, not all of them, but some of them are very strong climbers at elevation. And there are some, by the way, that do get just as altitude sick as anybody else. But yeah. there are some that are very strong. And so, and because they're local and they know the area and all that, and they are strong, that uh, you know, we'll hire them for various jobs. And some of them will be cooks, yeah. just cooking our food, which saves a heck of a lot of energy for us, yeah. you know, so we don't have to cook them. And some of them will carry loads to some of our higher camps. And so it, they help us stock those camps because there's, you know, our base camp is about 17,000 feet. Our highest camp on the north side of Everest is 27,200 feet. Mm -hmm. And there's several camps to get there. So they'll help with those. And uh, some of them will go on and, and summit alongside us too. And so people will use them in different ways, but, uh, and I think it's important, you know, whatever expedition you have, you know, you integrate them in correctly to what your, you know, your overall goals are, how you plan to use them. And so for us on that first trip, uh, they, we had some that were cooks. Some of them were helping carry loads uh, to our camps and stocking them. And then um, we had eight people who summited on our expedition plus five Sherpas who also summited. And so there were some of them that climbed with various team members some of them were kind of on their own you know as well but uh their i think their biggest value to us on that trip was just uh being extra manpower to carry those loads up and down and then just having the manpower uh, in case something went wrong you know if there's an accident or, or something you've got more bodies to help yeah. you know and and being strong bodies as they are they can be very valuable that way and thankfully nothing like that happened yeah so and how does that kind of relationship not only with the sherpas but with your fellow climbers when you're going on this incredible journey together you you, you see the best and you see the worst of a of a man or a woman when you're tested like how how do how does that relationship uh, go and how do you like work together as a team? Well, that's that's a great question because you know people with any team type activity you know there's dynamics yeah and there's there there are dynamics that make teams function well and there are dynamics that break teams down. And, and it's no different, you know, whether that's a volleyball team or a football team or whether that's a team of mountaineers. Yeah. And for, for climbing, for me, one of the things that's important is I want to know why my fellow teammates are there and what their goals are and their priorities are. You know, of course, we know their goal is, number one, safety. We, you know, we want to get back safely. We'd like to climb this, to the summit as well. But there are some people that have kind of a summit at all cost attitude yeah. and they're willing to take a few chances, a few risks that I might not be willing to take. Yeah. And so I want to know that people are on the same page as I am and thinking the same way that I am about what their acceptable level of risk is yeah. to do on, on a trip. And if that's not something that's within my... Um, my goals and you know and my ethic for climbing then i don't want to climb with them yeah. so i think you know that's one of the first things is knowing that can you learn that from a person without going on an expedition with them uh i think to a large degree you can you know uh, going on smaller trips with them and just talking with them and yeah. you know you know trying to figure out you know what is what are your goals for yeah. on a on a trip yeah. you know and it's you know it's and it's fairly I think obvious because everybody wants to go there and fulfill whatever it is, whatever goal it is that they have. Yeah. And you know, if your goals are not lining up, yeah. you know, then it's probably not the right, yeah. the right place for you to be, right team to be on. It is. And one thing that I'm thinking a lot about, I'm not sure it's, it's the same in, in when you were going on an expedition, but I knew as a martial artist, mm -hmm. when we were competing and training really hard and preparing, you, you, 
when you're in the hardest spots, you can see how people really act. That's There's the crazy correct. ones, win at all costs, right? Mm -hmm. Which are super dangerous, but it, usually they go very far. Uh -huh. But you don't want to be around them, especially if you're climbing Mount Everest, right? Sure. Then, then there's the people that gives up very easy for, from the first setback. And then there's the intelligent people, and then there's a lot of in-betweens. Sure. Like, how, what do you, do you do as a leader to kind of find that out? Like, is there any specific questions, or just or you just great with people? It's, well, it, it, it's a process. Yeah. Certainly, it starts with your first conversations with them and then continues throughout the trip. Yeah. And, you know, there's been expeditions that have not done so well because people get on these trips and they find out that their their goals are just not meshing yeah. and and that will break a team down and so there's no support of each other you know yeah. for that and so uh it's it, it's a conversation it's a process but it you know it's an ongoing thing it's not just you know one conversation you know hey what do you want to do on this thing and yeah. you're done you know it's it's definitely yeah. a process that continues and you're right. When people get stressed, yeah. you know, that's where you really see, you know, where they're, what is really driving them. Yeah. And, you know, and sometimes they'll, some things will come out that are red flags yeah. and then you got to make some decisions then. And they're not easy decisions, you know, yeah. but, you know, for me, it's uh, safety is going to be at the top of the list. I want to get back down safely, get home to my family, number yeah. one. And, you know, if I can get to the summit and have a good experience with team members along the way, great, you know, but that's, that's the first goal right there is safety. I think that's, that's kind of like committed to the process unattached to the outcome, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and doing it time after time after time. And that's why we see you've done this so, so long and so successfully. Can, so can we just talk about like you do, you climb Mount Everest, why do you go back two more times? <laughs> so the first time I went was um, because it was something I'd had this goal of doing. Yeah. And, you know, I'd worked myself up as we talked about, got to the point where I thought I was ready to give it a shot. I did it. I climbed it. And that was great. The next time I went back was 13 years later in 2008. And 2008 and 2012, both of those I was... Uh, I was guiding, yeah. so I had um, I had made a decision that I did not want to be in the business of running big expeditions to Mount Everest, yeah. and the only way I really wanted to guide Mount Everest is one on one, just yeah. one one client who I had worked with who I thought was ready to be there and who I thought had an honest shot of climbing it, and yeah. so. Um, that's why I went back was was for them. And in 2008 and again in 2012, I, I was with people who I thought had an honest shot at being able to do this. People I'd climbed with before on big peaks. And so I, you know, I knew that summits are, of course, never guaranteed. But I, yeah. I thought there was a realistic chance they could make it. And yeah. so that that's why I went back those yeah. next two times. How, how did that feel to, to be a part and help someone else to achieve that dream as well? Oh, it's, it's, it's an amazing feeling that is so rewarding uh, for me, you know, to, you know, because it's something, of course, I knew physically I could do because yeah. I'd done it before. And to see them do something that they probably wouldn't have been able to do if I wasn't there with them yeah. and to be able to help set them up for success to do that it it was so rewarding for me uh from a on a personal level uh that uh you know to see that and you know and when you share these experiences with people you know whether it's mount everest or a lot of other any other climb you do yeah. you create a bond of friendship that really can't be duplicated any other way and, you know, there's something about, you know, the brotherhood of the rope, you know, of once you tie into a rope with somebody, you know, you're literally trusting each other's lives to that. Yeah. And so to, to share that experience, see them have that, that feeling, that elation, and, you know, now you've created this bond of friendship. And I mean, you know, these, these guys are some of my best friends, yeah. you know, and we could be, we might not talk, you know, for a few months, and you know, we the next time we talk, it's like we just pick up right where we left off. 
you share that amazing experience together. Yeah. 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 I'm I'm curious, like how hard is the actual Mount Everest climb? How does it work? Like how much is act is an actual climb and how does that work? So it's uh when when you look at difficulty of climbs, there's a lot of different ways to measure it. Yeah. And you know, for some it might be kind of a a technical aspect, for example, you know, if it's vertical rock climbing or ice climbing, you know, things that take some, you know, some skill to be able to do. And then there's other aspects that are just because of elevation, you know, it's taxing, you yeah. know, physically um, for that reason, or maybe it's carrying heavy loads, or maybe it's cold weather, you know, or various, various ways of looking at difficulty. And so with Mount Everest, there's nothing else that can compare to it in terms of the lack of oxygen that's up there. And it does a couple things. Uh, for one, they say that there's 21% of the oxygen you have at sea level. So there's not much up there to work with. And of course, you got supplemental oxygen, which helps a little bit. But um, everything you do makes you tired. So you know, you say you stop and you want to grab some water, you know, just, you know, and you carry your water bottles inside your, your down suit so they stay warm and they don't freeze. You know, so you stop, you unzip your down suit, you pull out your bottle, you unscrew the cap, and now you have to catch your breath before you can actually take a sip of water. That's how little oxygen is in the air. You know, you stop and you, you take your pack off to adjust a boot and you have to, you know, catch your breath before you can put your pack back on. Just every little thing makes you tired. Yeah. You know, when you're walking, it's, it's literally four to six deep breaths for every step you take uphill. That's how slow you're going, you know. So imagine, you know, say, you know, I've, uh, sometimes I'll speak to, uh, to classrooms, you know, of kids, you know, and I'll say, you know, how do you feel, you know, if you just take off and sprint across the playground? You know, you're out of breath, right? You know, you're breathing really hard. Okay, well, imagine feeling that out of breath just by taking one step. You know, and you're, so it's one step, and it's... And then another step. You know, that's how slow you're going. So it's, there's just nothing else, really, that compares to that in terms of your physical output. And... And the harder that gets physically, the harder that gets mentally, yeah. you know, and, and to, you know, to kind of think about how slow you're moving, yeah. but you're, you're kind of in this, you know, anaerobic state, but moving so slowly, there's a lot of time to think about turning around. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I bet. Is, so is, there, is it mostly like how steep is, like how small are the paths? Are you walk Like how do you mm -hmm. actually do it? And how many hours per day do you, do you climb? So, uh, well, um, Summit Day, like we had said in the beginning, I've climbed by Mount Everest by two different routes. Yeah. And so the, one of them is the south side, the south call route we call it. The other one is through the north call. Yeah. And those are two different uh, difficulties. Yeah. The, the south side would, I'd say it's a little easier in terms of, uh, you know, if you're going to try it one time, that's your highest chance of success, but it's more objectively dangerous. You know, there's, you've seen pictures of people walking across ladders over big yeah. crevasses and the Kumbu ice fall where ice chunks can come down. So there's objective hazards. So you actually do that. You actually climb mm -hmm. on ladders, like, and there's just, yeah, big old drop-offs below you, yeah. And then, you know, once you're through all those crevasses and through all that, you know, then it's just a matter of going uphill. Yeah. And, and you know, it's, sometimes it's a little more narrow than others, but you're not on any, you know, precipices or you're not, you know, vertically climbing over except for a few areas. There's a place called the Hillary Step that has about 30 feet of some rock climbing on it, but you just kind of hand over hand kind of climb up and over it. But... Um, from a technical standpoint, it's not that hard. Uh, the north side has more technical climbing on it. You've got to climb up more rocks, more vertical areas to surmount and get up over that. So, wow. Yeah. Why do you do this, Kurt? <laughs> I mean, you've done this for 33 years. Yeah. Like, 
Wh why is this so important to you? Well, it, uh, there was something about learning it when I was young and experiencing the outdoors and how that energized me and kind of fueled me into everything. You know, when I was, when I was in school, you know, it kind of fueled me there. Um, I did martial arts like you for a while. Awesome. Uh, and when I was in high school and still look back fondly on those days. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the mountain climbing kind of fueled that. It's like, you know, well, I knew I could do this. So, you know, I, I know I can perfect this roundhouse kick and this other combination and such. And so there was because I had done those things in the mountains, it gave me confidence for a lot of other things I wanted to do. And, and it's still that way today. You know, I, and, and I think it's very healthy to get outside of your comfort zone and try new things. And, uh, and, and mountaineering being as comfortable as it is for me gives me that confidence to do other things and try, try new things. So there's, there's that, and like I was saying earlier, there's some kind of some spiritual aspects to it all that uh, are kind of hard to explain. Um, you know, at the kind of the, the core of my beliefs, I'm, I'm a Christian, I believe in God, and I, uh, when, when I'm out there, I really feel like I'm experiencing a special part of God's creation, and I'm seeing part of the God's creation that very few people ever get a chance to see, yeah. which is very, very cool and special that I can come share with other people, but um, that fuels me too, just seeing like, yeah, wow, look at what he's created here, yeah. and now, you know, I can take that back and then go back to uh, and share that with other people, and then, you know, have those experiences that then give me fuel to try new things that are outside of my comfort zone and, you know, and show people, because I think sometimes, and you probably experience this in your martial arts world as well, you know, when you, when you reach a high level of something, people kind of look at you and go, oh yeah, well you did this, so of course you could do that. Yeah. And, and then people see me, you know, try something new yeah. and now I'm a beginner just like them. And, it, and you know, that makes people realize, oh, yeah, well, he's, he's human, too. He, yeah. yeah, I agree. Like, I mean, I was that weird little bullied kid who didn't have much confidence. But I, I pour my soul into martial arts, mm -hmm. and that gave me confidence. So I encourage everybody to do something and do it for a long time because it will, in help, it will help your life and improve your confidence. It's That's nice correct. to be good at something, right? Yeah. And we can all be good at something. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious, when do you stop? When do I stop? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I would say that as long as I'm healthy and as long as I have you know, the, the, the physical ability to do what I'm doing. And as long as I'm still enjoying it as much as I am, yeah. I'm going to keep doing it. Yeah. And, you know, I, there may come a time when either if I don't enjoy it anymore, that's the last thing I want to be doing. Yeah. Or, you know, physically, if something changes where I don't have the health I used to have to be able to do that, then it might be time to, to, to do something else. But until that happens, there's no reason to, you know. And your wife is okay with you going on all these crazy expeditions? <laughs> she, yeah, she knows what she signed up for. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I, I love her to pieces. And she has been so supportive of everything I do. Yeah. And, uh, and, and that helps as well. You know, there, if, if I did not have that support from her, it would make it a lot harder to, to leave and do what I do. Yeah. Kurt, do you fear death? <laughs> that is a great question. I, uh, I would like to just say flat out, no, I don't fear death. Uh, the, as far as from a climbing standpoint, I don't fear that I'm going to die on a climb. If, I, if, if that happens, something went terribly wrong, yeah. certainly. You know, I don't go there to die and, you know, anything like that. Is, uh, that gets to a, a bigger question, you know, and, you know, as, as a Christian, you know, I believe that 
there is a heaven and there's a place that we're going to go. We're only here temporarily on this planet, you know, and, and my father actually just passed away um, back in uh, just a month ago, actually. And so it's something, you know, internally I'm going through right now, kind of processing that. But, uh, you know, watching him in his decline, you know, he had dementia and, uh, and when he finally did let go, you know, we went, wow, you know, he's in a better place and he's no longer trapped in a body that's no longer working for him. Yeah. And he's in a place where he'll have fullness of joy for eternity. And how great is that? And so yeah. I'd love to be able to say, you know, that's, you know, it's a very practical matter. No, I don't fear death. I, I know where I'm going. Yeah. But we're human beings. We're human yeah. creatures. And sure, there's an element of the unknown. We can't experience it. We don't, you know, and so yeah. sure, there's going to be an element to that that is going to feel uncomfortable. And why do you think you are so comfortable with taking big risks? Uh, well, that's a, you know, I, I guess I don't feel like I am taking big risks. Because yeah. you know what you're doing. Where I yeah. know what I'm doing. Yeah. And yes, there's an element of risk to it. Yeah. But there's an element of risk to everything you do in life. And you can never eliminate risk. Yeah. You can minimize it to the best of your degree but you can never eliminate it completely. And you know, you hop in your car and you drive on a freeway in Los Angeles, yeah. you are taking risk yeah. every time you do that. And you know, people can drive their whole life and never have a car accident and be just fine, but there are people that will get hit by a drunk driver and it changes their life forever. You know? And uh, and you know, so there's there's going to be risks in everything you do. Yeah. And so you know, is, is what I do, uh, you know, some people look at it as being, you know, outside the norm and, you know, being daredevil and, and all that. I don't look at it that way. Uh, you know, I'm going to do what I can to minimize that risk. Yeah. And just like I'm going to be a defensive driver, I'm going to be, you know, whatever it is in my normal life. But there are people that spend their whole life trying to mitigate these these risks and eliminate this risk from their life only to find out you can't eliminate it. There's still things that can happen to you. Yeah. Um, let's say after this podcast, say I want to climb Mount Everest mm -hmm. and I've never climbed before. Do you think that's something that you can make happen for me? Sure. With how hard would that be? Like how much training and like to really do this the right way? So it's, it would take, a lot of training, it would take a few years to build yourself up to that point. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you in particular, you have a good physical base yeah. with all your martial arts that you've done. And so now it's taking that base and transferring it to, to climbing mountains, to going to higher elevation. And, and so it starts off, you know, just, just like I did, you gotta take steps. You gotta start by climbing higher and higher mountains getting a foundation of technical skills built up. And the more you go out in the mountains, the more experiences you have to draw on that you learn from that you then take with you to the next climb and the next climb. And so, you know, for um, asking that question as if, you know, you're one of many listeners out there, you know, anybody, we can take anybody and we can start the process. Yeah. And then along the way, you know, we might realize that, okay, well, maybe Mount Everest is not in your future yeah. and that's okay, yeah. you know, but everybody's going to certainly try and there's things that, you know, they can have their Mount Everest without physically being on Mount Everest yeah. and probably have a lot of fun doing it yeah. too. No, I, I think it's about enjoying the journey and the process of you things, bet. right? You bet. Curious, we don't have much more time. I know you have a, a flight to catch. You're going to Mount Kilimanjaro yeah. <laughs> uh, with a group of people, which is amazing that you took the time. I just want to know, like, at what point did you decide to do the seven summits, which is all actually pretty cool. If you can just mm -hmm. tell, talk a little bit what it is and that's why did you decide to do it and, and how, how, how did that feel? Sure. Yeah. So, you know, the seven summits for our listeners, it's the highest point on each continent and there's seven continents out there. And so uh, it was not an active goal that I was pursuing it was something that kind of came up through the course of my mountaineering career and my, and my work. And yeah. so um, 
there are some of those peaks that are easier and some of them that are harder. And you know, if somebody came to me and they say, I want to do the seven summits, I give them an order in which you know, you'd probably want to do them in. Uh, and What's that order? So Kilimanjaro would be the first one. That's the would be the easiest one there. And then Mount Elbrus is the highest mountain in the European continent. It's actually in Russia. And that'd be kind of the next hardest. And then um, Denali and Aconcagua would be the next two. Aconcagua, the highest in South America, and Denali, the highest in North America. And then uh, you have Mount Vincent in Antarctica. And then um, Karsten's Pyramid in Indonesia, which, by the way, there's a little controversy there, whether it's Australia or Karsten's Pyramid in Indonesia. Yeah. But that's another discussion. So whether you do one or the other of those, the one in Australia, Mount Kosciuszko, would be the easiest of all of them. But then Mount Everest would be the last one, the highest and hardest one there. And so that'd kind of be the order of things. Well... In the course of my mountaineering career, the first one I did was Denali, just because yeah. I got an opportunity to go as an assistant guide, and yeah. so I went. Yeah. And uh, you know, after that, it was Aconcagua, and after that, I did Kilimanjaro. And so these you know, kind of came up in the course of my work, yeah. and as the opportunities came and I got a chance to go, I did. And so uh, where some people do this journey, and it takes them you know, a couple years, um, it took me, I started my first one July of 92, and then two, that September of 2012, so just over 20 years to do them all. Yeah. And you're one of, it's about 400 and something people yeah. has done that, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. How, how does that feel? Does that feel good? Uh, yeah, <laughs> it, it does. It, 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 it's nice to know that I'm in this very select group, yeah. and even... You know, getting back to Mount Everest, you know, look at how many people there are in the world. You know, there's, you know, billions. Yeah. And how many people have climbed Mount Everest? Well, the first time I did it in 1995, I was the 714th ascent of that mountain. Yeah. And which I say, I put it that way because there were people that had done it multiple times to that point. Yeah. So I was less than the 714th person in the world. Yeah. Now, uh, summits have picked up after that, and I don't know where they're at now, but there are a few thousand. But still, it's a pretty small percentage of the world population that has climbed Mount Everest yeah. and gotten down and done that safely. Well, the Seven Summits is even a smaller group than that. You know, so you look at kind of what people would look at in the, um, in the sporting world as being big achievements, you know, having a a Super Bowl ring or a World Series championship or you know something of that nature or a martial arts championship. I mean, how many people have done that particular thing? And then look at how many people have climbed all seven summits. Yeah. There aren't that many of them. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, that feels pretty neat to be sort of a small select group of people. I mean, it is amazing. And one thing that I kind of once we're talking now what I see you are you're a true mo mountaineer because this is what you do is not always about the mountains it's about becoming very good at what you do mm -hmm. and climbing these mountains is just part of the journey is that correct mm -hmm. and and I think we see that with a lot of like champions and and, and great entrepreneurs or artists like Every, they are working on mastering their craft and then they get all these amazing accomplishments yeah. instead of doing it the opposite way. I'm going to climb Mount Everest and then I'm going to quit. Right. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about that? Well, yeah, I think you know, when it comes to mountaineering, like many of the other examples you just mentioned, it's, the mountains kind of end up being the backdrop of it. So it's not this, this singular focus of just getting to the top of this mountain or getting to the top and getting back down. That is a focus of it, but it's part of the backdrop of a bigger picture of, of your life. And, and so it, it, uh, it, it really, it works to, to add, you know, kind of this part being one part of it, it works to this greater picture of of what you're doing and you know and, and so you achieve this success this success in one thing yeah. but it's it, it's about this drive of not only achieving success in this one thing but then being able to do other things and do them well also yeah 
Kurt, I only have two more questions because yeah. I know you gotta go. <laughs> and uh, one of them is, I want you to imagine that you're 87 or 97 or something like that, and you're sitting in a rocking chair contemplating about your life. What do you want to see? What do you want to have accomplished when you're like looking out and just contemplating over your life? That's a great question. I, you know, I've heard people talk a lot about, you know, they say like the midlife crisis, you know, where they hit a point in their life and go, oh, wow, I wish I'd done this and I wish I'd done that. And, and I, you know, and I thought, you know, physically, I'm not going to be able to do this forever, certainly, and I'll hit a point where I'll be looking back on things. And I, I just want to know that uh, I, I don't want to have any regrets, certainly, and I don't feel like I will. I feel like uh, there's always going to be more mountains I could have climbed that I never would have been able to. Uh, there's other things in life that I will wish I could have done that wouldn't, you know, there's several languages I'd love to learn to speak. And I may not get to all of them, but it's nice to have those goals to do it. There's, you know, there's other things I'd like to do. And, but I think just living every day to your fullest extent and just knowing that you have done what you could do with what you, the, the hand you were dealt, I think that's what's important. And, you know, whatever it is you do in this world, and, you know, you're, there's always going to be more you could have done or maybe thought you could have done, but look at, look at how much you were able to accomplish, not how much you didn't do. And there's so many things you can do in this world. And, you know, that's what I think is really important, you know, to be able to kind of look back on that and then to be able to give something back, yeah. you know, and be, be kind of that, that shining light to others, you know, be that inspiration to others. And so, you know, you're having your own personal fulfillment of things, but then I really think, you know, and it speaks to just what we do in guiding, you know, it's not about your own accomplishments, it's about helping other people achieve theirs and being that light for other people mm -hmm. and being that inspiration to help somebody else achieve their goals. Yeah, so. that's, that's incredible. And the last question I want to ask you because we, we want other people to go after their mountain, whatever mm -hmm. it might be in life. Sure. What would be your first advice to people watching and listening now? Uh, what can they do to get a little bit closer to what they want to do in life? Well, I think the, the, the first thing is just you, you have a goal, start researching it and figure it out, figure out what it is you need to do to start doing it. Let's yeah. say you want to learn how to play guitar. Well, you know, talk to somebody who plays guitar. Well, how did you learn to play? Well, I, you know, I took lessons from, you know, and, and I know a great person who teaches guitar. And, you know, so you, then you go talk to them and maybe you start taking your first lessons and you know, learning from somebody else that way. Um, you know, you want to learn a language, you know, to find somebody who, who can teach you how to start speaking that language. Or you want to learn how to be a good mountain biker, or you want to be a surfer, or whatever it is you want to do, you know, start researching it, and then get your feet wet in it. Go ahead and just try it, and just know that the first time you do it, you're not going to be an expert, and that's okay, but getting outside of your comfort zone like that is healthy in and of itself, you know, and some of us are not cut out to do certain things, and that's okay, yeah. but I do think it's important to try. And just, you know, just take that step out in faith and you take that step out in faith and great things will happen. Yeah, I love that. Kurt, thank you so much. Uh, truly honored to have the opportunity to sit down and share all of this amazing tools with you today. So thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. It was a lot of fun and yeah. great conversation. <laughs> great. And we wish you all the best on your journey to Tanzania and Mount Kilimanjaro. Thank you, and, sir. And uh, we'll follow up with you and, and hear all the stories. <laughs> you bet. I would love to share them with you. Thank you. Thank you guys for watching this episode with Kurt. Uh, if you like what we do, check us out at ilovesuccess.co. We have almost 150 different conversations now with incredible people. Uh, on my website, you will also receive a couple of free chapters of my book, which is about goal settings and can help you 
to get your feet in the water, just like Kurt said today. Thank you so much and see you next week.